We certainly hope you enjoyed your 4th of July holiday weekend. We here at the Seattle Police Department certainly had a busy one. And here at Beyond the Badge, we have been equally as busy preparing this month's show. Good evening. I'm Detective Randy Husrick, and thank you for joining us this evening. In our opening segment tonight, Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper will be joining us to take a look at the relationship between the Seattle Police Department and this city's communities of color. And we'll be looking at where we are now and where we hope to be in the future. Our Up Close segment tonight takes a look at part of the City Council's 1999 work plan, which included an audit of the department's community policing efforts and how this audit may have a national impact. And our neighborhood focus will bring us here to the Pinehurst Park neighborhood, where we will see how the community worked together to address issues of concern in and around Pinehurst Park. And now, Detective Tina Drain has gone out into the community and posed a question. How is the relationship between the Seattle Police Department and the city's communities of color? How do you think that the police department relates with communities of color in Seattle? I think that the Seattle Police Department can definitely do a better job of and having more amicable relationships with communities of color and they could do a better job. Uh, I said, I've had a couple run-ins where I was, I was kind of, uh, you know, they, they thought I was, you know, I fit the description of, you know, a criminal or something that was going on. But uh, that's, just, that's just how they, that's just like their, that's their uh, routine, you know. It's like it's part of their job is to kind of, you know, suspect and, so I can understand that. I don't think they do a very good job. I've had a couple of uh, run-ins with them myself, and I am a person of color. Uh, they are a little bit more strict on people of color and a little bit too aggressive, I think. Uh, everybody of color isn't out to do something bad or isn't a druggie or isn't trying to sell drugs. My perceptions about the police department and, and communities of color are, are weighted very much by the media. I really don't know because I live in a very white community for the most part. Like I said, they're changing and that's definitely positive and uh, it doesn't it look as though they do so much stereotyping in terms of profiling of criminals here, but I mean, it, that still is a problem also for, for people that are vagrant or for people that look like they could be part of a crime, for them to be arrested without questioning. Um, they're, they're, they're attempting to make a difference and that, that means a lot to a person like myself. After speaking with some people on the street, we had a chance to hear from some of Seattle's community leaders and Seattle Police Department employees. From my perspective, I think that um, relationships between the communities of color and the police department are similar to the way they are across the United States at this time. And um, I think that they're not good, in my opinion. As a citizen myself, and I, I know that others also appreciate the work that the police officers do to make our streets safe. But also at the same time, I know that there are a lot of citizens out there who don't feel safe themselves from the uh, police. Uh, I've heard many um, concerns about uh, police and complaints about police harassment, uh, pol uh, police abusing their powers, police officers ab abusing their powers. And I realize that these may be just a few police officers that could be doing this, uh, but I think that that a citizen who may have experienced that, uh, it, really, it really affects them how they see uh, the, the whole police department as a whole. You see, I work in an area where, you know, it's uh, known as a drug area, and, um, and uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things, a lot of uh, people, you know, that uh, that uh, come from other countries like Mexico or so. I'm not from Mexico, but you know, they are known to be, you know, yeah, drug dealers. You know, sometimes I've been confused, you know, or, uh, and even treated, you know, as a drug dealer, and I feel really offended by that, you know. And, and, and it's very common for the person I'm stopping to outright accuse me, They're saying you just stopping me because I'm black or something like that. And I have my jacket on, I have my hat on. It's raining. They don't know what my race is. Uh, and I didn't know what their race is until I make contact with them either. Um, it's more, if I were to try to come out and, and, and try to convey something, it's, it's, it's maybe to consider what the officer is dealing with um, before considering it a personal attack. The officer is thinking mostly about positioning, tactics, uh, safety, um, before they're even considering the personality of the race, color, creed, 
cultural background uh, of who they're dealing with. Well, just talk to us. Just talk to us with compassion. Just talk to us with dignity and respect. Also, I feel that something if the officer have to detain or stop someone, a person of color, to, to be respectful and still yet man, do their job, but yet also show respect. Well, first of all, I think that the police department itself is, is in the middle. The police are in the middle in terms of uh, 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 the issues that I talked about are, are criminal legal issues in terms of, for example, the sentencing of people. That's a legal issue that has to do with courts. It has to do with the legislature. It has to do with uh, uh, people beyond the, the beat policeman, the person in the car. And, but they have to carry this out. And I think that that creates a problem because they're the ones uh, having to do what the community already perceives to, to be uh, uh, bad for the community. Naturally, we have to enforce a law, and I believe law has, is colorblind, and officers enforce the law. And when they're giving a description of whatever the suspect may be, that's what they go by according to that. I think that we can always improve upon what our mission is and what the realities of policing in a free society are, all the difficulties that a police officer has to deal with not only with the Constitution, but with criminal law and, and all the other myriad issues that the uh, men and women who work the street in uniform uh, have to deal with. Uh, we definitely have to make a better effort of explaining the realities. Well, I think it's definitely going to have to be a collaborative effort. That's going to require everyone to participate. I think that Seattle is a very diverse city. And once we start focusing on our common goals, and such as the reduction of crime and elimination of fear, well then, when we start to work together on those goals, we'll start to see the relationships improve. Well, see, what I see on the street now is a lot of police. So they are out here in the community. So there are things that are not happening now when they're here, so that makes it a lot better. We respect the police when they're out here in the neighborhood. And you feel safe walking the street, you know? One of the things I, I think we need to do is have more interaction with each other and, and, um, and try to understand. I think there's a history that is beyond the police and the community, actually. It's bigger than that. And there's a history of racism in our country that is reflected within the police department and gets played out in our community. And that there needs to be an awareness of that and an acknowledgement of that, that that exists in the bigger culture society. And nobody's figured out, and nobody in this country has figured out what to do about it. So I think that's, that's one of the things that has to happen. I, think, I guess what I think is important is, is that for real inclusion to happen for poor people and for, for minority people is that we, we have a sense that justice um, is uh, for all. And, and I know that may be naive in the present context, but at least I think we have a responsibility to work on, if nothing else, the perception that it is. And at this point in time, I don't even think we're working on the perception that it is. Should have been. There's been a lot of bad stuff that's happening in the past, but I'm, hope, I'm hoping that right, you know, right now uh, is coming a turning point in that where people will start to see each other as people rather than saying, putting a label on, on someone or even themselves. This is a serious problem. And I think that if we don't have a formula, if we don't have some kind of structure to, to proceed, if we, if, we, if we ignore it, if we say that what well, people should understand, or if we, if we, be very, if we take sort of a, a, what I perceive to be a negligent attitude toward it and say that, uh, and blame the victims, um, then all of the victims, th and without trying to uh, weed through this and, and get to some clarification of, of what we can do. To, to correct it, uh, then we're going to be, the, the community is not going to be best served. So I think that the groups that are now working on this issue, trying to come up with a formula, are, are groups that, um, that uh, hopefully can get us one step uh, ahead, a step closer to trying to create the kind of formula that would, uh, that would help these relationships. Good evening. With me tonight are two guests that will continue the discussion about the Seattle Police Department and race issues of the community. First is Police Chief Norm Stamper with the Seattle Police Department and Community Leader Debbie Barnes. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. 
Debbie, what's your impression of what you've just seen on that video piece? Well, I think I key in with Reverend Jeffries when he was talking about perceptions. Um, when there's a routine stop and a person has some negative history or perceptions of the police department, and they may be asking the question, why am I being pulled over? Is there something motivating it other than uh, maybe a violation of law? Mm -hmm. Versus maybe the officer approaching and maybe looking at safety issues or dealing with what was going on in that for that traffic stop. Mm -hmm. So I think perceptions is a real major issue that we need to bring to the table for uh, the community at large as well as the policing community. Okay, how about you, Chief? What do you think? I, I had exactly the same reaction. And in fact, uh, when I heard uh, Reverend Jeffrey talk about uh, perception, whether or not we're actually working on perception, I was struck by the fact that that uh, people are always talking about a difference between perception and reality. Well, my perception is real, your perception is real, as is Debbie's perception. And I think we just need to respect what we think we see in other people, and we need to hear the voices, whether it's the voice of a police officer talking about his or her concerns about safety and tactics and so forth, or a citizen who's, who's convinced that he or she has been the victim of discrimination, for example, that we need to hear mm -hmm. people say that mm -hmm. and, and, and honor the fact that that's how they feel. Okay, thanks, Chief. Thank Not you. surprisingly, we already have some calls coming in. First is Tony from the North End, and this is a call, I believe, for Chief Stamper. Tony, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you have something that you'd like to uh, say or uh, ask? I, I, like, uh, I still don't feel that uh, what the Chief did about that NAAC meeting, spying on people to see what's going on. Chief, you got problems all over Seattle. You need to face them. You got problems out here on the North End where we ask for help, and they just look at you like, you know, you're nothing. I have other priorities. If you want to take care of the problem, take a look uh, at the Tony, department. Tony, do you have a specific question that you'd like to ask? I'd like to know how come he hasn't got up and still made a public apology to the NAACP and the people in Seattle. Okay, thanks, Tony. Did. Okay, thank you. Tony, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you didn't hear the apology because it was made almost immediately. The uh, conference was on a Friday. We apologized on Monday. The apology, incidentally, was for not having announced ourselves, for introducing ourselves. Uh, we took this to be an open news conference. Um, my first reaction to it was, I'm glad we're covering it. I'm glad we're out there listening to what the community has to say. Uh, but as, uh, as Oscar Eason, the uh, local head of the NAACP, uh, said, the more he thought about it, the more troubled he became, and for me likewise. And so after considering the history of, of, of police surveillance that goes back many, many years ago, uh, I made a decision that an apology was the appropriate thing to do, so we issued one, and we accept full responsibility for that. Our apology, incidentally, has been accepted, I'm pleased to say. Okay. Uh, another question that we have is from Troy in the central area, and I think we just lost Troy. Troy, uh, call us back. We're sorry that you had to wait so long. We'd love to take your question. Uh, was there anything else that you learned from watching um, the video about what the folks on the street had to say since we did have a pretty good representative sampling. Well, I think the other issue is looking at dignity in the sense that everyone needs to be treated with a sense of respect and human dignity uh, no matter what our interaction with one another. And that certainly goes both ways, is that there is a mutual respect in our interaction with one another. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Troy did come back. Thanks, Troy. Troy, are you there? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, go ahead with well, your... Okay, my, I have two questions I would, would like for the chief to answer if it's possible. One is why do you take the police out the central area that is helping the community and, and that is working with the community to stop drugs and violence? You take that police officer out of the area and everybody's used to it. That's the first question. The second question is why do you take a person of color or any ethnic group and accuse them of something because they're in the Pacific area. I, Thank you. Yeah, those are both really good questions, uh, Troy. And in fact, um, I, I need for you to understand that I don't make personally the assignments of our officers to their beats, to their districts, or for that matter, their precincts. Uh, sometimes people get moved because they get promoted. Sometimes people get moved because uh, they have taken a specialized assignment uh, outside of patrol. I generally support very strongly leaving police officers in, in their communities long enough for them to get to know the people and problems and of their assigned areas and to build the partnerships that we've been talking about. 
So I'm a, a very strong supporter of extended beat tenure for our police patrol officers. Um, we do not automatically uh, stop people because of color or race uh, as a matter of policy. Needless to say, you're going to expect to hear that from me, the police chief, but I want to state it and assert it. We have um, absolutely no interest in, in stopping people for uh, reasons only of color or race or ethnicity. Uh, if a suspect in a bank robbery, for example, is described as white, we're going to be looking for white suspects. If the suspect is described as black uh, or Latino, then we're clearly going to be looking for individuals who, who fit that, to use the popular term, profile. But we have to have a reason for the stop, and, and that's the key. And uh, my personal commitment to you, to our department, and to our community is that we will not engage in the kind of racial profiling that we have seen in certain other parts of the country. And Chief, if I can also add to the reason for transfers, uh, sometimes if it's a newer officer, that's part of that officer's training is to be transferred perhaps from uh, one precinct to another. Or sometimes the officer wants to make a change, or maybe wants to try a different area, or try a different shift, or a different assignment. So sometimes that action is, is even brought on by an officer uh, to do something different. So uh, I think most officers generally remain um, you know, where they are. Uh, often because they want to be, or sometimes manpower dictates that someone be moved uh, to, to, to meet a need elsewhere. So back to the video. Was there anything else about some of those uh, interviews? Not necessarily the, the people on the street, but some of the other interviews. That yeah, I there. actually want to comment on the, uh, uh, the, the uh, statement that was made by one of our officers. Uh, Officer Eli Chase talked about safety. Uh, and every officer is, has safety uppermost in his or her mind when making a traffic stop or any other routine stop uh, in, in, uh, in our business. Um, I've made it very clear to my supervisors and managers that the most important responsibility they have in fostering the health and safety and well-being of the workforce that is the Seattle Police Department is that every single one of those officers makes it home at the end of his or her shift every day, every night, for an entire career. Police work is dangerous. Uh, there's altogether too much violence in our society and in our community in general. Uh, and as it relates to those who have an official responsibility for peacekeeping in the community, I want to make sure that they're safe. I think our citizens need to understand that there are certain steps and measures that we take in the interests of officer safety. So I'm glad the officer was able to make that comment. Mm -hmm. Debbie, how did you become involved in the community and with the police? <clears throat> different committees and so on? Well, just looking at the whole issue of um, a traffic stop, um, years ago, and it's been several years ago, certainly pre-Norm's um, um, involvement with the Seattle Police Department, there was, uh, he was attending college and he was working at night and he got off in the wee hours of the morning. The nature of his work meant he wore a hat and overalls and things to protect him from the elements that he was in. During that stop, he was um, thrown against the car, he was threatened, and a series of things transpired at that time. Uh, this was a, uh, had a major impact on him. He attempted to go through the system and wasn't able to gain access through the system. And when he d was able to speak to people, uh, they discouraged him. They said, whose voice are they going to believe, yours or the officers? And so that had lended itself with my family for a long time. Um, about five years ago during a social event or a community event, I had the opportunity to meet Norm Stamper. And I shared with him my concerns and my views of the department, which were not in the most positive si in light. Uh, at that time, I felt as though we began to be heard. Uh, they shared, I had opportunity to share my perspective. My husband had an opportunity to talk about what had occurred years ago. And even to the point of what could they do today uh, to look at this particular issue. From there, he also said, hold me accountable. Uh, do get involved, be a partner at the table, mm -hmm. and see what we can do to further community policing so that the community really understands that they really have an opportunity to direct and mold policing in Seattle that will work for them so that their community is really free from fear and also how to hold their police department accountable for the work that they do within okay. their communities. 
Okay, I'd like to get back to that after we take this next call sure. because I'd like to continue coming in that direction. Um, Laurel from West Seattle has something that he'd like to say. She, I'm sorry, Laurel. Hi. Are you there? Yes. Go ahead with your question or your comment. But, um, I have a question for Norm Stamper, and I'd like to know what efforts um, are the police department doing in alleviating the perception of racially motivated police stops? Well, you know, um, we, we come from a tainted history, and I think we need to be absolutely open about that. If I could erase certain chapters of our history as, a, as an institution, I, I, I would do that. The reality is we can't. And, and so we've got to acknowledge the racism that has existed, that does continue to exist in many police departments. I'm not naive about my own, but I think you set a standard uh, that is intended to be met uh, every single day and every single stop that we make and every single contact that we have with our citizens. And so setting a, a non-negotiable standard and enforcing that standard is where it all begins, but it also is in, consistent with what Debbie has said, a joint effort. We need citizen feedback, recognition, and praise for work that's being done by our police officers when in fact it's praiseworthy. Certainly, when there is negative or critical feedback, we need to hear that as well so that we can act on it case by case. And I think making very, very clear that we will not engage in, in the uh, driving while black enforcement practice that was, in fact, institutionalized in at least one other police department has, has got to be the minimum for a, for a professional police agency. Racism is abhorrent. And there's no better way to destroy a relationship between a police department and a community than to engage in it. Jason, are you there? I am. Go ahead. Hi, uh, this is a question for Chief Stamper. I had heard from a colleague about the grant that was uh, given from the Department of Justice to the National Coalition Building Institute and the real project that they're doing with the Seattle Police Department. Now, I wondered if you could comment on that a little bit and how that might help with the relationship between the police department and communities of color? Well, I'm, I'm delighted to comment on that. The National Coalition Building Institute uh, has, in fact, secured a, a National Institute of Justice grant to do work. In, in fact, there were a number of cities competing for this uh, grant, and NCBI was successful in convincing the, the Justice Department to bring it to Seattle. So what we'll be doing is looking at the very issues that we've been talking about tonight, creating opportunities for dialogue between police officers and citizens uh, with the express purpose of dealing with the very, very delicate, seemingly competing demands of, of public safety and police accountability. They're not in competition at all, of course, but when people perceive them to be, it makes it very difficult for, for the mutually trusting kind of a relationship to get established. And NCBI is going to help us with that. I'm delighted to, to, to learn that they got the grant to do that. Okay, Debbie, I want to go back to what you were talking about earlier, why you became involved. Mm -hmm. Now that you have become involved, and I assume your husband is also involved, um, how has your perception changed, or has it changed, about the police department now that you become more aware of, of what we do and why we do it? Well, I have to say part of the um, change has been the access point. Um, what I hear from people in the community is they d they're not feeling a sense of access to the department. And to be able to share information about why certain things happen, what is happening on a routine stop, what should their expectation be, has been really powerful to be able to share information as I gain information. And also to be a part of CPAC, where one of their projects was to develop a citizen's academy. And that's the effort to allow citizens as you and I to come in and to learn why certain things are done in all the different departments in the, uh, within the Seattle Police Department and to be able to ask the questions to find out how do we partner this effort and how do we begin to create a community which is truly free from fear. Okay, uh, CPAC being of course the Community Policing Action Council. Tina, let me, let me turn the tables. Uh, I know that you did the interviews on the street uh, that was uh, Tina's head that you saw holding uh, behind the microphone on the uh, interviews on the street. And you shared with us off camera your reaction, and I, I think it would be useful for the viewers to, to hear how you reacted to these uh, statements. Well, frankly, um, I was surprised and I was saddened by what I'd heard. I've been here a long time, over 20 years, and uh, I had the perception that we had come much, much farther uh, because I, I believe that we have. 
I'm not in uniform. I don't have the same experiences that patrol officers have any longer. But I do a lot of follow-up cases as a detective, and I hear over and over and over again from victims and even from defendants uh, how well they were treated by the police. And so it was a real education for me to hear this. Painful, but educational. And uh, I do believe that, um, although I may not share the perceptions of what I heard, that I'm sure willing to listen to that. And I think that anything that either side can do to improve the communication and try and understand what each other does and, and uh, why we do what we do is, is going to do nothing but improve uh, relationships. Any final comments before we end the segment? Yeah, I'm glad I turned the tables and asked you that question. <laughs> okay. A, a, a wonderful response and really, I think, sums up where we want to go in the future. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I think it was a very uh, strong piece of information that we got from the video and also some, some good points made by both of you. Next, on Up Close, Cindy Grenard looks at the audit of our department-wide community policing efforts. Hello, I'm Officer Cindy Grenard from Beyond the Badge. As part of the City Council's 1999 work plan, one of the activities they created was an audit of SPD's community policing efforts. The benefits of the audit, we feel, will help define community policing. Now let's hear from Director Nancy McPherson of the Community Information and Services Bureau. Seattle has a unique opportunity to be the first city in the United States to measure its community policing approach. And as you can imagine, it's difficult to do that because some of the things you're measuring are intangible. How do you measure whether or not you've prevented crime? But those are some of the issues that we really want to come out in this discussion about community policing in our city. It's important as we look closely at community policing to ask the question, community policing compared to what? And the what? is incident-driven policing. The difference between incident-driven policing and what we do in Seattle, which is called a problem-oriented approach to community policing, can be really clearly seen by this illustration. Tree Franco, to a uh, subject responding with a 30-minute ETA and a wide In an incident-driven approach to policing, it is the incident that drives police activity. Notice here, there's an incident, then an officer response, an incident, these are all at the same location, an officer response, an incident, an officer response, over and over again. And typically, the response includes one of four things, making an arrest, writing a report, issuing a warning, or clearing the scene or leaving because you don't see the activity occurring. What does this look like in the community? Uh, to this one particular block, the next block from our block, uh, next block south from our block, uh, there was over a thousand 911 calls within a four-year period, uh, which is quite a lot. And we were kind of shocked by this and tried to think of a way that we could combat this activity. We saw a lot of prostitution, drug dealing, uh, a lot of violence, littering. Uh, just calling 911 and having a patrol officer respond is just sort of a stopgap type of thing. It, it's a reactive thing. You're reacting to a specific problem, but you're not getting to the root of it. In the case of the community at Beacon Hill, the community stopped looking at these incidents as single isolated events, and so did the officer, and they began to see this as a problem that needed to be addressed. When we go from call after call after call after call, you have a repeat pattern where the officers have to respond to the same address, the same problems over and over. Uh, first of all, that takes a lot of time, whether it's on a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Um, when we go from that to problem-oriented policing, we're trying to look at the whole package. Why are we going there on a continued basis? In problem-oriented policing, once the responding officer realizes that the traditional approach isn't working, they begin to look at this in a different way. This graphic shows how a different way works. It is the single isolated incident that comes to the officer's attention once they notice that the response isn't working and they notice that there are repeat incidents occurring, then they step back to begin to ask questions about why is this problem occurring at this location. 
That's called the analysis of a problem. Once they understand why the problem occurs, then they develop a custom-made response that deals with the real issue. That real issue is intended to address the underlying conditions that created the problem in the first place. The result is that we reduce calls for service or solve the problem. So how do we know if we have community policing? Well, we really need to move beyond the I know it when I see it type of thinking because there are really some very specific things that you can look for with community policing. And there are two primary strategies that are used in organizations that are really committed to this philosophy. The first strategy is problem solving. And that is looking for places where there are repeat calls for service or repeat complaints from the community or where the community has a concern that there is an issue that needs to be addressed and using our resources to both understand and respond to those problems. In problem-oriented policing, once the responding officer realizes that the traditional approach isn't working, they begin to look at this in a different way. This problem first came to my attention uh, in the intersection of West Marginal Way and South Spokane Street on the lower level. The traffic was backing up very badly uh, both directions and I couldn't tell why. And uh, there wasn't anything I could do with the traffic. There was no place to send it. It was just complete gridlock. And I, I got out and started looking and it appeared to be backed up um, all the way to the terminal. Uh, in both directions. This intersection is uh, the entrance to Terminal 5 where they offload uh, containers uh, from the ships and then truck the containers over to the rail yard. Um, so first thing I did was walk out to the terminal to see what could be causing the problems. Uh, and it seemed to back up at lunchtime more. So I walked out to Terminal 5 and found out that all the, the gate personnel that let the semis into the terminal were at lunch all at the same time. I also found out that um, the port engineers didn't know this. I found out that the truckers who were coming in didn't know that the, the gate people went on lunch break. Uh, basically, nobody was communicating with anyone. Basically, working with the Port of Seattle, they were able to um, talk to uh, the the port was able to talk to the the people at the gate, and were able to talk to the people at the the truck yard and get them coordinated so that they could either not send trucks during lunch or they could keep personnel on at the gate. Um, and I've thought a lot about um, what what problem solving is about and the steps that you go through. And I found myself kind of naturally going through the, uh, the scanning, looking at what the problem was, and then actually looking uh, what could be causing the problem and analyzing the problem. And th those things just kind of naturally flowed uh, in this situation. It wasn't a big uh, production where I did a bunch of paperwork and you know, it involved weeks of work. It was just a matter of a little bit of legwork and talking to a few people and um, coming up with a solution. The second strategy that's really important in community policing is the strategy of developing partnerships. And partnerships involve working closely with the community to identify problems of mutual interest and then work together to try and reduce or solve them. Over the last two years, Pioneer Square has experienced some dramatic drops in crime compared to the city of Seattle as a whole. In 1998, crime went down 11.5% over 97. And in 97, it went down nearly 6% um, over 96 in King Sector. And the results throughout the rest of the city were not nearly as favorable. Yeah, the, the drop in crime is, I think, largely attributable to a change in the relationship. I think communities that want to address crime and disorder in their neighborhoods have to be a willing partner of the police. I think that problem oriented policing is a worthwhile way of doing business. It uh, allows us to create community partnerships because uh, 
We can't do it all ourselves, the police, and so we have to do it together. And by putting more heads together, we come up with more innovative ways to solve problems. I think some of the challenges of, of implementing POP is educating the police and the public about Promorian policing, what it is and what it isn't, and what we can do with it. Also, allowing officers the time, as a supervisor, allowing my officers the time to go out and actually work problems, knowing that maybe their productivity is going to go down a little bit in one area, and realizing that as a supervisor, and then um, encouraging the other officers to do uh, team building with them and, and uh, pick up the slack when they're out working on a, a project. Our commitment with the problem-oriented approach to community policing is to make the very best use of existing police resources. We'll always need more people. We will always need more resources. But one of the guiding principles of the way we're operating as an organization is to say, how can we make the best use of what we have? How do I feel about where we are today in implementing community policing? There are some wonderful people in this organization and in the community who are very committed to providing the very best service possible. And they see problem-oriented policing as a vehicle for doing that. But there's a lot of work still to be done. This audit is an excellent opportunity to offer a clear choice, a choice between incident-driven policing or a problem-oriented approach to community policing. Let's go back to the studio and hear from Detective Randy Curtis and Director Nancy McPherson. Now, continuing along those same lines, I want to thank Cindy for that piece. And in the studio with us this evening, I'm pleased to have with me the Director of the Community and Information Services Bureau, Director Nancy McPherson. Thanks, Nancy, for being with us. Thanks. I appreciate that. Now, I think the first would only be more appropriate that we answer, uh, or have you answer, the fact that you have recently announced that you'll be leaving the department. Is that right? Right. And uh, would you want to set the record straight about why you have announced you're leaving the Seattle Police Department? Oh, absolutely. When I first came here, Chief Stamper asked me to come and be part of his executive team and actually to come with a specific job in mind, and that was to develop training, to develop people, and to do some work on organizational development. Um, and I'm almost done with that. Mm -hmm. My plans were to leave um, next year. And I decided with the community policing audit that was just talked about in the recent piece to announce that early, mm -hmm. to uh, let people know that I didn't have a personal stake in the outcome, that you better believe I have a professional stake in the outcome. And I wanted to be here through that entire process to make sure that um, our case for problem-oriented policing is clearly stated. So you're not leaving the city to avoid the audit or any of the whatever might be disclosed or uncovered through an audit? <laughs> uh, absolutely not. Okay. In fact, I'll be the one sitting across the table from City Council uh, talking about the results of the audit. Now, one of our local newspapers, I forget which one, recently had a description of you as the controversial community policing director, which probably couldn't have been better if they maybe also threw in an insult with your mother. <laughs> uh, How does that type of thing make you feel when that type of press is put out? Well, actually, uh, I would have to say that's probably pretty accurate, um, considering <laughs> that um, I think anytime somebody challenges the status quo, that's controversial. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't come here to just sit behind a desk and do nothing. Um, I came here with a specific focus in mind. So, I, you know, I'm sorry that some stuff has to be controversial, but I think anytime you stand up for what you think and believe, that can be controversial. Now, speaking of controversial, one of the things that seems to be following the Community Policing Bureau is the controversy of how much money is spent on community policing versus any other area in the department. Is that something you feel comfortable addressing? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, I think it's really important to know that we have asked each one of our employees to go through eight hours of training in problem solving over the last five years, which actually in the big scheme of things is not that much training. Mm -hmm. But we have spent um, a lot of money on developing curriculum, developing leaders in the organization. The majority of money that we've spent, though, on grants, we've had over uh, $18 million in grants since I've been here. Actually, that's up to $20 million because we found out two weeks ago that we're getting an additional $2 million for information technology. And Randy, did you know we bought the bomb robot with grant mon money? I appreciate that. Uh, bomb squad is very appreciative of that. And firearms training simulator, training for investigators to develop specialties. 
uh, a variety of things that grant money actually goes for, and actually a very small percentage of that goes for community policing. But there's a huge emphasis nationally as well as locally on community policing, so sometimes it seems like that's where the emphasis Most, yeah. is. With 1999, what's the next step for the Seattle Police Department and community policing, you think? What's your forecast? I think the next step for me over the next eight months, which is where, where I plan to finish out my tenure, um, I really want to anchor some of the things that we've been doing. There are people throughout this organization who are very committed to this process, um, some who have been very quiet, and now it's time for them to step up to the plate and say, you know what, this type of policing, we've made a good business case for doing it, and that is making the very best use of our police resources. Mm -hmm. So I think we want to see people step up to the plate, both in the community and the police organization. I really want to anchor problem solving in the organization. We want to anchor some of the leadership um, stuff that we've been doing. So I think that we're going to be in a really good position. One other thing, too, is that we have totally um, revamped the way crime analysis is done in this organization, and people will now have great technology tools to be able to identify and understand problems, mm -hmm. and that is one of the major investments we've made with grant money over the last five years. So we're going to keep the training going then, uh, increasing maybe? As a matter of fact, we are. We've just recently moved the training that was done in my bureau to the training unit. Uh, mm -hmm. Captain Gleason is taking responsibility for that now. We'll be starting that up again in September and we will be off and running and that is here to stay. Great. Thanks very much for coming in Nancy. I Thank appreciate you. it. Next up. Uh, Randy, could you pardon me for just a moment? Jump in. Um, we have a special acknowledgement tonight. Joe, walk, don't run to the table with that cupcake because we understand that somebody just had the big 4-0 birthday, oh, and we wanted to ask if you would join us in uh, eating this, this cupcake this right after you blow out the candle. Wow. So You're all going to get smacked for this one. <laughs> cupcake, that's what the... Thank you very much. That was good, Nancy, Joe. <laughs> what goes around comes around. Next up is the eye on crime. <laughs> and I'm, I'm speechless. Good evening. Welcome to SPD's Eye on Crime. During tonight's show, we'll take a closer look at sexual offenders and the sexual offender notification program. Let's check with Stephanie Brandis to find out what individuals have recently been released. Hello. My name is Stephanie Brandis of the Sex Offender Detail for the Seattle Police Department. Tonight, we are highlighting sex offenders now residing in the north end of the city of Seattle. This notification is not intended to increase fear. Rather, it is our belief that an informed public is a safer public. Our first notification is on a level three sex offender by the name of Victor Newman. Victor is a white male with a date of birth of 129 of 63. He's approximately 35 years of age.